Awesome. All right, guys, we're going to get started. Thank you all for coming to our How to Navigate the Freelance Photography Career. My name is Alyssa Porner. I am a photojournalist at the Atlanta Journal-Constitution, and I'm also a board member for the National Association of Black Journalists Visual Task Force. Um, we're really excited to have this opportunity to talk to these great photographers who are some starting out in freelance and some who've been in the game for a long time, some that do editorial work and some that do commercial work, just about what it is to jump into that field. Um, before we get started, I'm going to introduce our panelists. We're going to start with Gabriella. Um, Gabriella Angati Jones is a freelance photographer based in Los Angeles, California. She was previously a staff photographer for the Los Angeles Times, and her work focuses on the intersection of race, identity, and environmental justice. We have Andre Laro. Andre Laro is a Jamaican-born photographer based in Brooklyn, New York. From his work as an Adobe Creative resident, exploring stories across the country, to working on the set of W... Oh my goodness, I can't believe it. Come out, thank you. Bell's United Shades of America. Andre seeks to see the fundamental truth in each human being, regardless of background, cultural, and upbringing. And we have Sharice May. Sharice May is a loud at portrait and editorial photographer based in Washington, DC. She is the co-chair of the photo committee at the National Press Club, a board member of Focus on the Story, an immediate past president of the Women Photojournalists of Washington, an Adobe education leader, and an adjunct professor at her alma mater, Howard University. Thank you guys so much for coming. We're excited to have this conversation and we're just gonna jump on in. Um, so the first question that I have for you guys, and we'll start off um, with Sharice, since I feel like you have the most uh, experience. Um, uh -oh. When and why yeah, did you Sh decide? Sharice's titles are like, I was like, I I'm happy to introduce her at last. I feel like <laughs> I should put on a sports coat or something. <laughs> so the first question is, when and why did you decide to pursue a freelance career? Um, I'll tell you, it started when I got laid off, hmm. actually. Um, I worked for newspapers uh, doing graphic design, actually. I wasn't even in photography. And I had been 10 years um, at USA Today and got laid off. And I was, you know, I was doing photography on the side and I was teaching at Howard as an adjunct at the time. So I just decided to step out on faith and do that, which I was passionate about, which was photography. And I said, you know what, I'm going to give this a shot and, you know, see where it goes. And I haven't looked back since. Awesome. And what year was that? Do you mind me asking? Uh, let's see. That was 2000, 2001. Wow. 21 years. That's awesome. Oh, no, no. I take oh. that back. 2005. 2005. Okay. Still a good amount of years. That's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, Andre, what about you? Why did you decide to get into the freelance world? Um, yeah, I mean, I... Also, I want to apologize. Uh, my neighbor chose this time to blast music. If you hear, just I don't know. Yeah, anyway, um, yeah, man, I, I've had many conversations with the little boy, and he just is not having it. <laughs> um, anyway, so uh, my background is I was a journalism major. I went to, to the University of Florida. Um, I was really hoping to get hired for something or as an intern when I was graduating, and just didn't happen. And so. Um, really early in my career, if you want to call it that, I, I really was embracing the idea that photography could be used in different ways. And a really um, big moment for me was uh, Groove Shark, the streaming music platform that was kind of like before Spotify was popping, but like after Napster, it was kind of a bridge. Now they're sued into infinity, so they don't exist. Um, I interned there and kind of that was the first time I worked on brand work. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I would argue that almost all of my time has been freelance. It wasn't really on purpose. Um, the main time I wasn't was when I worked at Walker and Company um, for Alyssa. That's they're down in your deck of the woods now, but they are uh, um, not not a, they are a startup for that make health beauty hard products for people of color. So I worked on Bevel and I took oh, photos yeah. and wrote copy and um, a lot of those photos that are on boxes now are still my photos from 2016. And so the big pivot for me was they said, hey, we're going to close our New York office, get to move to San Francisco. And I was like, no, nah, I'm all right. And so um, that was it. That was the big moment. And for almost a couple months after that, I did the residency with Adobe for a year. And then after that, you know, I was trying to figure out if I wanted to get a job. And my Adobe mentor was like, why don't you get a job? Like, just keep working on what you're working on. And that was 2018. And now not, not even counting last year, it's been, you know, two and a half full years or three full years of just 
try to work on the things that I want to work on, but often just having a bunch of small bosses along the way. Wow, it's super interesting. You had so many uh, avenues. You said you did some copy too, in addition to photo work. So it's like you were chopping it up in so many different lanes. That's awesome. Yeah, I mean, I think it was helpful for me, but continue. Sorry, I don't want to take any You're time good. Gabriella's talk. What about Gabriella? What about you? Why did you decide? You said it seems that you're freshly off of uh, the LA Times staff. Why did you decide to go freelance? Um, well, I think I originally always wanted to go freelance just because um, I wanted more control over the ideas and the amount of time I wanted to spend on the ideas that I wanted to do. Um, and so that was like the first reason. And the second reason was like, I knew I had, like I wanted to meet a, like a monetary goal. Like I wanted to save like six months to a year's worth of expenses before I could decide to go freelance. And I was fortunate to be able to meet that goal um, last year. So um, yeah, and I just decided to go and just go for it. And I was also like pretty burned out working in newsrooms, especially after last summer. And y'all have probably read everything that happened at the LA Times last summer. So it was just like a lot. And I just felt like it was the best decision for me at the time. Awesome. So uh, two of you spoke, talk about, talked about a little bit about like going off kind of on faith. I mean, Sharice kind of said she had to go because she was laid off and she wanted to go into it. That was ad. 2010, actually. I was like, I went back five years further yeah. to 2010. And that was a hard time because that's kind of when the economy. Yeah. Per point. Yeah. yeah. Um, so tell me what that was like going off of faith. It sounds like, Gabriella, you had more of a plan mm -hmm. in place. But Sharice, yeah. tell me what it was like for you to go off on faith and go that route. Well, for me, um, one of the blessings was because I was laid off, I got a package. So mm -hmm. I did have like a cushion in case, you know, I needed to to kind of pull from there. But to be honest with you, it, it felt like freedom. Mm -hmm. um, I can remember like after, you know, working for so long at, at the newspaper, being like waking up that next day and I was talking to my dad and he said, how does it feel? Because I'm not getting up and, and driving into, um, into the newsroom. He said, how does it feel? And I said, like freedom. Like I, <laughs> that was like the first word that came to me because I didn't even realize. And I think part of it, part of it for me was I was no longer being fulfilled in graphic design because I started out in graphic design. So I feel like because I wasn't feeling fulfilled there, it was a blessing in disguise. Hmm. And so for me, it was like just that right thing because I guess I wasn't taking those steps to just kind of, you know, go off the path, so to speak. So I got you. Yeah like freedom. That's awesome. What a great word too. And I can, I think I can understand that, you know, the ability, like Gabriela was saying, to kind of sh shift your own narrative and tell your own work without worrying about the strings of a newsroom attached. Um, the next question I have for you guys, and before I ask, I want to remind people that we do have a Q&A chat that uh, you can go in and ask questions. We can see your questions and we'll probably answer them throughout the conversation. So feel free to ask away. Um, we are looking at those. Um, the next question is, I know that with freelancing, I mean, you're essentially your own entity, which comes with branding yourself. So how did you brand yourself on social media and how have you been able to separate yourself from other photographers? We'll start with Andre this time. I mean, um, that's, that's tricky. I mean, just for everyone that's in here, um, the first thing I would say is the community that you have reflects the opportunities that um, will be afforded to you. Like, I mean, now I get emails out of the blue for things, but very often in the beginning, it was a question of association. Um, I graduated college in 2013. I was going to say 2009. I was like, that's why I graduated high school. I'm being silly. Um, but right when right I graduated college was like, maybe Instagram wasn't at its peak peak, but it was like that kind of tick down. And so you could DM almost anyone and ask them if they needed help on something or just, it was right when like DMs were open and people were still really kind of feeling that community. And so the first thing I would say is like, above really standing out, like your work is what stands out, but um, like your work will get you in the door and who you are is gonna get, get you hired. Um, I'm not speaking from an editorial sense. I only probably do like 15 to 20 editorials a year. Um, so I, I don't, I can't speak to that specifically, but I will say that almost every brand you interact with every day, the coffee shop you go to, the clothes you're wearing, all of them need photography. Don't let them call it, make them call you, con let, don't let them let it, call, let you call it content. It's photography, it's art. but to stand out, like you need to make work consistently. You need to um, figure out ways to 
dry run stuff. So like if you want to shoot um, for Nike, that means that, you know, the your local college's sports games you need to be there. That means that um, if someone has like any sort of sporting company or sporting goods company that is local that you can work with, like you need to be able to do something 20 times before you can produce it at a high level because that panic when you have that commercial job is very real and you need to be very prepared for it because everything you think you're going to do once you're there isn't going to work. So you got to be ready for it. But essentially, really, it comes down to like who is around you? How can you help them? How can they help you to make better things? And um, figuring out ways to be consistent and to have people around you that can work with and learn from and then also produce with. That's why I'd say like more than standing out, it's like a lot of times you'll get jobs just because like maybe um, Sharice is busy and she's like, oh, I think yeah, Otter can probably handle that. Um, and that is your, that way in allows you to then deliver and keep getting hired again and again. So um, more than a competition, you need to collaborate with the community around you and be, and have them understand who you are and what you're trying to make. That's an excellent point Andre made. I'm sorry if I could uh, add. Okay, go ahead. Um, community uh, is very important. So just looking at who is in your community, who's surrounding you, because he's right. Like it happens more often than not that um, sometimes I'll get a call or, you know, my friends, you know, in that community will get a call and they're busy. They can't do something. It's like, hey, here's Sharice over here. Or here's, you know, Alyssa over here. Um, so that, that is like very important to um, have that community. Awesome. And Gabriella, do you have anything to say as far as building a social media presence? I mean, I know that, you, like you said, we're kind of you're kind of starting in. Yeah. But you have yeah. been in journalism before, so how was that? Did you need to brand yourself? Was that something that was I mean, necessary? I don't think I like. I didn't feel like I needed to brand myself. The one thing I really focused on while I was at the LA Times was getting verified because um, they, first of all, like when you work for a media company, they can literally do it for you overnight. So, and then like second of all, like when brands see that, they want to look, they want to work with you, no matter mm. what your count, your follower count is, just because what the algorithm works. Mm. But um, I remember, but like separately, like I remember I was speaking to Whitney Richardson, who uh, worked, was a photo editor at the New York Times. And I was just like, I was looking at her Instagram and it was just her, like so uniquely her. She was like always posting about her hair and like being weird. And I just remember asking her like, like, don't you just think about what they're going to say about you? Like, you're just, you're just being weird on Instagram. She's like, that's okay. Like, just be yourself. Mm. And I've, ever since then, like, I've just <laughs> been like more inclined to post work that I, that I'm like lo love. And like, I post memes now and like little videos and stuff like that, because I think it's really important that brands get to know and editors too, like photos too, get to know mm. your personality, because mm -hmm. I think that's how a lot of people get work is like you as a person as opposed to like the work that you produce. Of course, your work is like, has to be great and of a very high caliber, but like, if you're easy to work with and if you're fun on set, like people love that. Awesome. Nobody wants to work with a jerk. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That's oh, awesome. Let me clarify. No one wants to work with us if we're jerks. If you have talent that's a jerk, they'll still work with you. Let me be very clear. Literally. They do not care. The talent can come in and punch somebody in the throat. They would be like, bet. But yeah. if, if we did that, it would be a problem. Um, yeah, I just, you know, really, like mm -hmm. I, I said it, but I really want everyone to hear this. Like, just as the just as much as we have like our favorite musicians that are from our hometowns or we know really well that we love them deeply and maybe they don't have national notoriety, even for all of you, you are someone's favorite photographer and that has, has weight, right? Um, and your goal isn't to like be the greatest photographer. Your goal is to tell a story that you have access to. Mm -hmm. um, and that is how you're going to get noticed. And you show a mastery of your surroundings, then someone knows they can take you elsewhere. Um, yeah. Awesome. Yeah. That's, that's, that's huge. You, you don't know how many times like an editor has said, like, I can really see your voice, you know, mm -hmm. in, in the work. This is what I see that you do well. So it really is important to master those things that are important to you and are true to who you are because then it'll be easy to continue to be yourself versus trying to emulate you know something else that you're not or trying to tell a story that you you don't have a connection to because it it'll be evident in the work that you do yeah 
And if I could just piggyback on yes. top of that, I think like if you have like a news background, you already have those skills of storytelling that not a lot of photographers have naturally or practice with because they don't get to shoot every day. Mm -hmm. So I think that like, if you have those skills and if you're confident in those skills, like you can get work if you are able to like put yourself out there and like be a good person, all that kind of stuff, whatever they said too. So Yes. <laughs> awesome, you guys, that was great feedback. I'm gonna jump to the Q&A real quick, um, which will help me segue to one of the questions that I have. So we have a few people asking about making a living off of freelance work. One question is, how do you make a living? And the other question kind of, I guess, would point more to Sharice because she was talking about freedom. It says, is the freedom of freelancing worth the risk of not having a stable position? So I think that kind of goes back on the faith and the trust. So yeah, so who wants to, we can all that's tackle a, it. Yeah, that's a personal decision on if it's worth it. Um, because certainly there are things sometimes that I can't do because you know I'm waiting on you know, this payment, you know, to come in from an invoice or something, or, you know, just different. I move differently than when I moved when I was a staffer, mm -hmm. but at the same time, it feels like good. Like, I feel like I can focus on those things that I really want to do, or that speaks to me, you know, versus, you know, before where I'm, you know, working to satisfy whatever is thrown at me, mm -hmm. um, so to speak. So it's up to you whether that freedom is worth it based on what makes you happy. So this makes me happy. Yes, thinking of yourself, essentially. What makes me happy? What can I do? Does anyone else want to jump in? Um, I would just have to piggyback on that and say like, yeah, I think that's like the mo main motivating factor for going freelance is like, how can I be accountable for my own actions and my own happiness and like weighing that with the risk, the financial risk of it? Because like, like I said, like you're mostly at a loss. Like I'm on the project I'm working at, like I'm spending so much money, especially on film processing. Um, and um, it's just like, you kind of have to be comfortable with like living on a very tight budget and like keeping your expenses extremely low and investing like basically everything you have into your career especially when like when you're like me, when you're just like starting to figure things out in it and um, also be okay with not having health insurance. So yeah, so, <laughs> I love that piece <laughs> That's yeah. And I think that with Sharice, because you're a professor, you're able to get health insurance, right? So you don't necessarily. So, it's, uh -oh. you know, oh, so I'm, a, I'm an adjunct, so I'm not a full-time, gotcha. you know, professor. So I but pay America for America is own. evil. <laughs> <laughs> So I pay for my own health insurance. Gotcha. That's, that's one of the things I have to like budget for to take care of. Um, but it's, you know, it, sometimes I just have to make decisions on things I can do, things I can't do or purchases I may want to make that, okay, that's not going to make sense right now. Yeah. I need to, you know, make sure that I'm able to take care of my health insurance or, mm -hmm. you know, do this, do that. So it is very, um, as Gabrielle said, um, you have to have a budget and just kind of make those decisions and plans based on that. And then sometimes it, you know, you may get a lot of work in a particular time period and then you're able to, you know, take that money, invest or, you know, do other things so that when there is a slow time, you know, you'll still be okay. Awesome. That really answered another question that just came in about is it stressful for you to line up enough consistent clients every week? You know, even if you have been freelancing for a long time, do you still get nervous about meeting ends meet? And I think you answered that well. It's just like, you kind of have to manage your money, um, which was going to go into my next question, just about managing money. I mean, you essentially are your own entity. If you're a freelancer, and you're kind of your own corporation, your own LLC. Um, so you have to pay taxes differently. You have to kind of watch what you do. Can you all give me... Um, do you do any of you have a story about how you were able to understand how money was different, you know, as you decided to go freelance, you know, you don't get that consistent paycheck every week. How did you learn about paying taxes? How did you learn about budgeting yourself? I learned because one of my friends who's an influencer and, you know, shot has shot Converse campaigns and stuff. I remember once we were having lunch and he said that he owes the IRS $20,000 and didn't realize. And I said, word, <laughs> seems unfortunate, my guy. Um, but I learned, I learned, I learned from him. Um, essentially, so I have an accountant, but the thing I will tell everyone here, 
get QuickBooks. When you first get it, you'll be like, oh, this is $30 a month. This is ridiculous. Then when QuickBooks sends you a DM and says, hey, you have like five unpaid invoices and you're like, oh, wow, I have money that I forgot to follow up about. And I'm all, everyone here will tell you there are clients that will be like, oh, yeah, like, yeah, yeah sorry. Or like when pandemic hit, I had clients, we shot something in, I photographed something in um, January. And in June, they're like, oh, yeah, you know, pandemic's been hard. And I was like, yeah, but I, you know, I need that 10K. So, <laughs> so and, and, you know, my agent was like, we'll see you. And they're like, bet. But what I, the thing I really want to say is like, you know, make sure that you are using something to look at your money. This is, I don't, QuickBooks doesn't pay me, but I would tell you, they should, but I would tell you to use it because it will show you how you're breaking it down. Mm. Like Gabrielle is talking about um, in your first year, you're spending, a, you're spending a lot of money that you're not realizing, like to do your projects and before maybe like a client or your employer would be paying for those things. Like obviously going forward, like, make sure that you try to save some of those big purchases for jobs to see if you can include them in your expenses. Um, but then also like that, that's where the community comes in, figure out ways to like share things and use things that make it easier for you. And as you're struggling to find work, um, to find work where you are the head honcho, you are the person photographing, there are still things that you can do um, to make money for yourself. So like, you know, my first year after the residency, like I um, did some, social strategy strategy for Red Bull because my friends work there. Um, I will do a wedding or two. I don't really like doing weddings. I just, I it's stressful. But like, if you need it, like obviously being hungry knows no loss. So you, you have to do, but more importantly in your community, there are people that are sh doing shoots that need someone to just watch the gear and someone will pay you a hundred dollars for three hours to just stand there and make sure everything's good. And that thing's helpful. I mean, someone has robbed me before. So um, someone to hold reflectors and believe it or not, those times when you're assisting on things that if it's a thousand dollar shoot, someone give you a hundred dollars, not only would that pay you a hundred dollars for the day, but that'll stop you from spending money elsewhere because you're on set. Um, and also it will, you'll be with a whole new set of people that will then see you as a viable candidate to collaborate with in the future. Mm. Um, <clears throat> and as people that you can just learn a process thing with. So that's BTS, like anything that you can get your, your hands working with. Like, I think people come to these things when they were in person and be like, yeah, all right, I'm gonna get all these contacts and make all this bread. But like, not really, it's really, people don't really know you till they see you working, so. That's true, um, working, yeah. Money-wise, like that's the best thing is like figure out ways to limit the amount of money you're spending, um, whether that's putting yourself in a position where you're only like, someone someone's looking at your money or using quickbooks or something like that and then second um in that first year making sure you have enough money it's not like obviously this is an abj so like we're not all talk, well, there have to be some people in here we're not talking to people that whose parents are like i got you for two years or something that's not the case like you are responsible for yourself that's a I painful wish. and stressful thing that will eat at you every night i'm not gonna lie to you and say you doesn't but like there's a mindy kaling quote i really love where she just says like you know when i was struggling to eat I was writing all these scripts, hoping somebody would care about it. And I was panicking about that. And then now that I'm supposed to be put on, I'm not panicking about something else. And that's all life is, just transitioning panics. So if you can start to master the panic ahead of you um, or be as in control of it as you can, it will reflect better as you progress. And some of you, as you're freelancing, you may decide you don't want to be a photographer. The goal isn't to freelance to do, you know, to go all these steps because you don't know where it's going to go. The goal is to take charge of what is in front of you. Beautiful, awesome. Does anyone else want to add anything about money? Just like learning about money or learning about how to manage money as a freelancer? And specifically, I just got a lot of questions about how to hound people for invoices or money that they owe you. <laughs> a lot of people are That's asking really those questions. Job. So, I mean, and if you have any um, say on that, Sharice or Gabriella, just about like how to get people to pay you on time in addition uh, to other. Yeah. Um, I mean, I would say I do, I guess, more editorial work than commercial. It's like some, some commercial, um, fortunately I haven't had like a big issue with that because it's normally like with editorial work, the publications have their process and they pretty much stick to it. Well, I would, but it, there were some things like corporate stuff that I did where, yeah, I had to have those reminder reminders sent out. And then I just had it like on like autopilot, you know, because I didn't want to keep like typing the email like, hey, you still haven't paid me. Right. So I would just have it automatically sent out. And I think it, 
for me, before I went to the step of like getting a lawyer and I think them seeing it a couple of times, they were like, okay, <laughs> okay, let me find, you know, cause it, nothing is more frustrating. And, and I've been told this before when I was like chasing down an invoice one time. Oh yeah, I just been busy just sitting on my desk. And I'm like, Thanks. okay, like that's not really helping me in taking care of these bills over here. So it was simply that, like, I'm thinking mm-hmm. like, you know, I know you don't want your check to be sitting on somebody's desk. Right. So it's that kind of thing where it's like, okay, come on, really? Sounds like you need your own repo, man, just to go up there and get your stuff for you. Man, so yeah, it's, I think if that is like a big issue for you, then you may need somebody on that letterhead mm. legally to to send that little nudge. And I think that would probably get it going faster. Literally any of your friends that's a lawyer, it doesn't have to be like a law, it could be a real estate lawyer, just be like, <laughs> and this thing, and that should be enough. But like also one quick thing, if you actually do other, this happened to me recently, it really surprised me. Um, this agency was like, yo, we're net 90. And my agent was like, no. Ooh. And so they said, well, if you want a net 30, we have to, we're going to take like 5% out. We were like, what? No, like, no, 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 no. I heard that. So everything is negotiable. You may not always get a yes, but don't just take everything at face value. And it's really tough for all of you editorial folks that are basically editorial because you're kind of taught that your work has no worth. You're like, oh yeah, I give it to the paper and they do whatever they want and they just have it forever. But like, no, that's not how that works. So sure, like the New York Times just asked if they can license one of my photos for this piece. It's the Times, that's beautiful, it's great. I use it, it was for something else, they used it, that's fine. Um, But generally like your work has worth um, and so one of the reasons why you want to go freelance is like when I worked at Walker Company, I made all these photos that I'm sure made them quite a bit of money. And then you look back at it, you're like, oh, wait, hold on. Like, <laughs> I, don't, I don't know if this amount of money um, reveal is equivalent to my value or my work. So maybe the freelance will work out, but it's dependent on you of how that stress works. Generally, your first three years of working a job, you're like, oh yeah, like this is amazing. And then like year three and a half, it's kind of like an NBA player. You're like, wait, you need to pay me way more money for this. <laughs> um, and so just in spades it comes but everything Sharice and Gabrielle are saying are very accurate I just want everybody to get their money so I'm excited I'm sorry <laughs> you're good can you explain to people who don't know what net 90 net what does that mean yes uh net 30 90 or net, net 30 60 30 45 60 90 and 120 which is nuts so um I I've never had a net 110 I've heard of it um <laughs> yeah me <laughs> Gabrielle literally is like I have to go um, yeah, I'm like no we don't do that here <laughs> we share a client you, the two you and I and they pay fine. But essentially what happens is you can sign a contract and they will say upon completion or upon the the signing of the contract, mm-hmm. completion of the, pro- co- the pro- project or signing the contract, we will pay you 30 days from that, 60 days from that, 45 from these, that, 90 okay. days from that. So that's one month, two months, 45 days, a month and a half, one month, a month and a half, two months, three months. Three months is too long. And I promise you almost all people that do net 90 are playing with you because they're never going to pay you on time. Like it's just too far off. Um, the best things I would say is when you when you sign the contract, before you sign the contract, ask them for all the tax information and anything their accounting department needs, and do not sign the contract until they get all that stuff and say it's approved, so that all of it is pushed in beforehand. Because sometimes people like to play that game with you. You finish the project, they'll say, "Oh, sorry, we didn't have your W two or this other thing," um, and they'll get a little tricky. But those are just ways that people pay you, um, mm-hmm. and so just something to keep in mind. Yeah, thanks, because I, I don't know what that means. Go ahead. Yeah, no, I was gonna say that is a key, what Andre just said, and get that financial paperwork done ahead of time before you sign the agreement, because that needs to, to be in there so it can process before signing the contract, doing the work, and then it's like, yeah, just send us the, you know, mm-hmm. yeah. Nah. That's what I, I normally will ask, like, if I'm doing like some commercial work like that, I'll say like, you know, send over the, the you know, do I need to sign an electronic transfer fund, you know, form or whatever? Can we get that before I even, because once you sign that contract, once you do that job, they have what they want. Right. Yeah. So if you ask this like before that, then they're, they're prompted to right. do it quicker. Yeah. Yeah. Also, QuickBooks is helpful because it'll show you your profit and loss. So you'll see, or whatever you use to organize your money, zero QuickBooks, something else I forgot the name of, you can say, oh, okay, this month I spent this much and I made this much, or at least I invoiced for this much. So you can kind of get an idea of, you know, who's playing with you and what's going on with your money. 
Yeah. Um, if I, if I could just like, yes, thing real quick is like, I'm super new to this. So I'm like learning this too, as we talk about it, Awesome. but <laughs> my friends and I, we do share which clients don't pay on time mm. and which paper editors don't pay on time and like, don't keep on top of stuff. And we like try to not work with them. But if we do, we just like have that in mind and try to plan ahead. But I think that's definitely, you have to keep an account, like, especially with editorial, if it's like an editor that doesn't get to something like, do I want to do this story? Like, do, can I wait to get this paycheck? Like, Mm -hmm. is it worth it? Mm -hmm. Like that kind of stuff thinking of that. So. And that goes back to the importance of community because Mm -hmm. you have a community that will let you know, like, Hey, I worked with them before I had issues or you know, they pay late or make sure you do this, Mm -hmm. make sure you ask for this. Yeah. That kind of thing. So yeah, for sure. Awesome. Like I wasn't even asking for mileage until my friend was like, you don't ask for mileage. Like, what are you doing? And I was like, (laughs) oh, so (laughs) that's an extra 15 bucks. So yeah, yeah, it helps have friends. Yes. Awesome. That's good to know. I know I heard a lot of people during the pandemic also talk about hazard pay, um, Mm -hmm. like things they can get because they're going out into um you know not the wild I don't know why I was going to call it that but they're just going out into the world photographing during the pandemic did you have to ask for that were editors speaking more editorial did you have to ask for that were editors more like hey we're going to get you this before you go out how did that work I only had to ask for it um a couple of times and then other times if it was somebody someone knew I was working with I would just ask like hey this is hazard pay right you know just because I hadn't worked with them Mm -hmm. but in terms of like editors that I have you know worked with if several times I knew that that was, you know, they were on the, ha- yeah. or they would say ahead of time, like, yeah, you know, this is hazard pay. Like we got you on the hazard pay. Yeah. I think it was interesting during the, or like during this is just seeing like what the newspapers like value their employees at mm. and like seeing the differences between like, <laughs> like all the different hazard pays and just be like, oh, mm. they don't really care. So, um, and some don't do hazard pay. Yeah. Mm. And it's like, yeah. Yeah. No matter, no matter what is like no hazard. And so were you turning those things down or was it just like? Um, I did a couple of those okay. and I did it because of what it was. Mm-hmm. And I felt comfortable enough that I was like, okay, whatever. Um, yeah. I have a, you know, you know, I want to do it. So I gotcha. yeah. yeah, but that's not, that's not the ones that I gravitate. It's a case by case basis you're saying. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. Well, I've got a couple questions about just pretty much making connections um, in the panel. I mean, in the discussion here, a lot of people are just wondering, how did you get your first assignment, whether that be editorial or commercial? A lot of people are wondering, how do you um, create a relationship with an editor? Can I cold call them, cold email them? I mean, a lot of you have that background. I mean, Sharice, you said you were at USA Today, so I feel like your name was kind of out there already. In, not in maybe not. Though. Yeah, I was going to say not in yeah, photography. Yeah, so for me, that looked like joining organizations <laughs> like NPPA, NABJ. Uh, well, I was already an NABJ member. Um, Diversified Photo, Authority mm-hmm. Collective, um, Women Photograph, Pal. Like, those organizations are good to... Uh, have this community, but also it's good networking because there are also editors who are members of these organizations. Mm -hmm. So then that gives you like an entry point instead of a cold call, like you'll have, there'll be certain events and the editor will be there and you're able to go and engage and speak to them in conversation. Um, Also, um, organizations will have uh, databases for jobs. And Mm -hmm. so they share that with editors who are able to connect to that database and say, okay, I need a photographer in DC. Let me see who's here, look on this database. Uh, Black women uh, photographers Mm -hmm. is another um, great one and they have um, a uh, a database. So that part is good. And then what it it is, is you have to network. Mm -hmm. So it's a matter of networking, letting people, like getting to know people, letting them know who you are, um, and then it's also going to these portfolio reviews, going to these workshops, because portfolio, what the portfolio review will allow you to do on the editorial side, I can speak from, is to sit in front of these editors and be able to share your work. And they're able to see like a glimpse of, you know, who you are. And you just did the New York Times portfolio review, is that correct? I did. And tell yeah. me how you found out about that real quick. Sorry, I didn't mean to cut you uh, off. Yeah, no, no, no. So New York Times portfolio is like known in the industry. Like if you're 
in editorial to do that. So um, I had actually applied once before and didn't get um, didn't get selected. So um, I did it this time around. And you know, by this time I've been doing a lot of work. Mm -hmm. So you know, the people I was connecting with are like, yeah, I already know you. You know, I've already you know seen your work or whatever. So it it was more so like getting to know me outside of just looking at my work, you know, on my website, then they're able to like talk to me and see my personality and what I care about, you know, who I am. So it, you know, things like that are really great. Mm -hmm. um, so I would definitely say like anyone who is considering like work, like editorial work and, you know, I'm not sure how it looks on with, uh, you know, corporate, mm -hmm. but definitely do those portfolio reviews. Definitely, um, Outside of that, definitely apply to these um, competitions, mm -hmm. because even if you, you don't get selected for this, these are editors that are looking at this work and they're able, you know, they'll see it, they'll see your name and you may not have been selected to win that competition or to be, to be selected for right. that exhibition, but they'll say, oh, let me, um, let me put Sharice, file Sharice over here because I really like their work. So, mm -hmm. you know, maybe we can work together at a later time. Awesome. Yeah, and you also real quick were a judge for the photographer. Is it photographers of the year? Uh, uh, P O Y. Yeah. Uh, uh huh. The um, and I'm gonna get this acronym wrong. I think it's photographers uh, of, of the year. year. Pictures, pictures of the year. Yes. Pictures of the year. Yeah. So yeah. that that was um really fun. It was intense. Mm -hmm. um, we because it was like live streaming over. I think we did two days, like two full days, mm -hmm. because there's a lot of work you know that comes in to go through that. So um, it was it was really good though. It was really good to be on the other side of it. Yeah. Do you mind, Gabriel, if I go to Andre and ask, you know, how does <laughs> how does that happen in the commercial world? How are you able to get clients? I mean, how did you get your first client? You said you kind of did a residency with Adobe, but how did you? Uh, or am I? No, 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 no. You're good. Um, I don't know. How I feel about Lee Frog and Gabriella. She probably has some good things to say. Well, I mean, we can go back to her. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> nah. <laughs> She's like, I'm not even trying to be in this room. <laughs> but, okay, so um, first, the first job I got after the residency was uh, something for Uber. It was um, this project about, um, it was to help like promo Spike Lee's, uh, they did something, he did like a film with Uber, which sounds like fake, but it happened. Um, that one, I think my agents just sent me, but usually what happens with me is, um, so I just wanna say, Sharice made some really great points about work and getting it out there. Um, really, you know, I just want to make sure that everyone understands, like, the distinction in the work is really just your, what, how much ability you have to alter what's there. So as an editorial person, you aren't changing a ton, and as a commercial person, you change a lot. But at the end of the day, it's still delivering on a vision. So you can do both things. Um, and I got, we got this question in the Versify Photo Chat a while ago, like a couple months ago, and someone was like, oh, like, what if I shoot this court thing for a corporate client and they're like later editorials is not want to hire me? I'm like, look, dude, you have to do what you want to do. And if you need some money and it's not, they're not like Halliburton, like do it. So that's, that's worth saying. But second, um, my first year, I didn't make a ton of money, um, but I just finished residency. I had a little bit of money. So I think I just made like, like, I don't know, between resident and like, April to the end of the year, I probably made like thirty-five, forty thousand dollars, which to, to me in fifth grade was a lot of money. But I'm happily making more money than that now. But that was just that year. So, you know, what really worked with me is I did something. Another, th I worked with Uber once, and um, they just were looking for more people to promo this thing. And on my end, what I was really lucky was um, they had done a lot of influencer work and had realized that if they pay four people to post about it, who have two hundred thousand followers. Um, it let's say it costs $200,000 to post. They could take that 200,000 and give 2,000 of it to 50 people or 5,000 to 20 people or whatever. Um, and they would have a much larger reach. So I was getting kind of that tail end of, mm. or I was kind of hitting that point of people being like, oh, this is actually much more effective than like a billboard. This is maybe more like a neighborhood ad. Mm. Um, and so I worked with that client once. Um, and then one of the, um, Basically, like there's an editor kind of similar when you're working with commercial clients is generally you have like an art director, you have like a team of creatives and they work as an intermediary with the client versus when you're working at a, at a newspaper or a publication, like the editor is assigning something to you, you work with the, like you with the writer to get a story um, or sometimes just to highlight the story. 
but here can be tricky because you're trying to like feed two heads. You're trying to make this art director happy because they may move to another client tomorrow and they could want to hire you again. And you're trying to make this client happy. So the client would might want to advocate for you and hire you again. So like essentially you want to over deliver on both senses. Like the client always wants more of their product, even in unnatural ways. And the art director wants to pretend that they are the most artistic person ever. So you need to like deliver both things and also just listen a lot. Um, you know, if you, I, I have an agent now, but sometimes I don't get, I didn't, I don't get jobs through him and I'll send them over. But a lot of the things are just people that I worked with mm -hmm. then going somewhere else or someone seeing a project I did and then sharing it. It would surprise you. The thing that really stood out to me recently is like, um, Gabriella talked about like sharing memes and being more yourself. Like, um, some of you have seen that work I did called equity through editing, where I just wrote all this stuff. Um, and it was, there's not even, it hasn't, hasn't been a photo on my Instagram in weeks. Um, but I've gotten a lot of work from it because people mm -hmm. are now interested in how I think. And mm -hmm. so I would just say that like, whatever you're photographing, like if it's an editorial thing, great. Um, if it's a commercial thing, great, but make sure you understand your process and that you can deliver that thing again, like know how you got that photo so you can do it again and again. Um, and so, yeah, I would just tell you like getting the attention of folks you can, I wouldn't ever cold call anybody on the phone. That just feels aggressive to me personally. Um, I hate when people call me on the phone that I don't know for with no money. If people just call me to talk to me, I'm like, yo, no. But um, but if you send an email, keep in mind just a couple of things about emails and websites really fast. Okay, emails and decks, they are gonna be seen on the phones, right? So whatever you're sending needs to be not longer than a single scroll over phone. I'm not gonna read it. No one's gonna read it, first of all. Second of all, decks, optimize them so that they're easy to see vertical. If there's any videos you have or anything, try to make sure that your reels or things are under 90 seconds. Like, just like if somebody, if any of us sent you a video, you didn't know us, you'd be like, I don't wanna, I, they seem nice, but I'm not gonna watch more than 90 seconds. Number two, on your Instagrams and your Twitters, make sure that your emails are easy to see and your websites are easy to see. You can be funny, but make sure your work is somewhat prevalent and it's pinned and easy to reference. Make sure that on everything there are links so people can find the other parts of you on the internet. If your name is not Andre with a U or Gabriella has two last names, it can be difficult for people to find you. Um, and then on your website, when they get to it, people are gonna go to your website last generally, but you need to show not always, not only your best work, but your most diverse work within the first three to five pieces of photo or video that is there, because if not, people are gonna make assumptions about you very, very quickly. So just make sure that um, if you get people to, to hook and say, oh, like what's going on over here, that you can show that the diversity of the things that you can do um, and just figure out how you wanna use your social platforms differently. That's a conversation for a different day, but be prepared to, people are always looking, but like when they do look, like sometimes people will ask me to look at their work and I go on, I'm like on their Twitter and I can't find where it is. Like no one wants to do extra work for you. And lastly, put your phone number and your email at the bottom and your website at the bottom of your email um, signature so that later if someone decides to work with you, they can find it easily. Awesome. I think that's really good. Sounds like, you know, your website and your social media is kind of your first impression before they even meet you. So they want to be able to get to that information as fast as possible. Unfortunately, people don't have as much patience as they used to back in the day. So they want that information in two seconds. If they can't find it, they will skip over you. I've heard so many, you know, conversations with people, editors would be like, well, I was looking at your page, but I couldn't find your phone number. I couldn't Don't find your do email. the contact form. Yes, right? thank God. Not like contact oh, forms. <laughs> I, knew if I, did, I knew if I didn't say it, one of y'all was going to say it. Take, <laughs> turn the contact forms off for the love of God. Oh God. <laughs> like that's, that's the same equivalence of like, I remember I had a friend who was like, oh yeah, like I keep my Instagram private so it'll make people want to follow me. I'm like, no, sir. <laughs> that's not how that works. I'm not yeah. doing extra work to, to follow you. So thank I've you, had work Charisse. Commission commission from being seen on Instagram mm -hmm. and I I've got commissioned for jobs because you know people following on Instagram and seeing some work and they're like ah because the thing is like editors are like they have so many things coming at them you know all different directions and what happens is when they're focused on one particular project or story that's where their focus is so if they see something that connects to that, it's like, oh, Andre, like he can do, like we're looking to do this and he's gonna be, he's perfect for this. So it's social, like to be honest with you, like I started out Instagram with a private account, mm -hmm. but then after like evaluating that, I was like, no, it needs to be open. Like, I don't care like if the person follows me or not, but I want it to be accessible. So right. see. Awesome. Yeah. 
going back a couple mm-hmm. of minutes yeah. to when um, Andre was talking about being able to reproduce photos you've already done before. Um, when I first started like my project on Black Girl Surfers, I did not realize how many photos would get licensed for that. And I didn't realize that like a big brand like Apple would be like so stoked about it. So mm-hmm. like one of the things that I was told before I went freelance was like, make sure you have like a personal project mm-hmm. um, to work with because like it helps you to keep create and it helps you to experiment and challenge yourself. But also you're like creating images that um, creatives and ed- editors can see mm-hmm. and um, they can kind of get to know you a little bit more about. So um, yeah, that's it's that was definitely something that has really, really helped me in the last year. Having yeah, it. personal projects are huge. I agree, Gabriella. Like that's the thing. Like uh, Alyssa was talking about with the portfolio view, they want to see that. They're like, so what? What are your personal projects? Because mm-hmm. you, they want to get to know you. Like they want to. They want your personality versus you know there. There are a lot of people that do gr- good work to mm-hmm. do great work, but what sets you apart? You know, in right. that you know, are you someone that people you know want to work with? Are you someone that can connect with? who you're, you know, taking the photo of, or, you know, what assignment that you're doing, you know, um, most recently for me, like there was an assignment, um, I had like a, um, a portrait for People Magazine. So it was um, Dr. Corbett. And so, you know, you would think like scientists, you know, we gotta be like real, you know, whatever. I turned yeah. on some Beyonce and <laughs> she was, <laughs> she was all in. She had fun to the point where she like, put it in her stories on Instagram. Like, you know, I love this photographer. She turned on that Beyonce and we went to work. Come on, yeah. Beyonce answers yeah. every question. <laughs> <laughs> so it, it's also, a lot people should of- be hiring Alyssa. Alyssa, we gotta big you up some more. Whoa, I'm just the moderator. I'm on yeah. staff, I'm on staff. <laughs> Doesn't matter. You're right, you're right. Yeah, like Andre said, it's a lot of like managing. Listen, trying to keep the bag, y'all. <laughs> Don't mess with my back. Um, <laughs> Not the bang. Right. Um, <laughs> sorry, yeah, we're getting off. It's like managing those things. It's like, you know, being able to anticipate like what may resonate or connect mm-hmm. with someone so that you can get, you know, who they truly are. Awesome. Well, I'm going to really quick, um, y'all, I mean, had some really great stuff to say. I'm going to try to go through these questions that folks have. We've answered a few. Uh, Tandy or Thandy, I think it's Tandy Brown asked about passion projects and y'all she kind of asked you know how are you able to keep doing those um but you all answer that question another question about uh that I saw was about so a question someone had something a question about portfolio reviews they said they're not really familiar with the process what is a portfolio review do you want to answer that Cherie since you just did one I I can or if anyone else wants to I mean a portfolio review is where um you're able to sit down in front of editors and show your portfolio show your work and they give you feedback, you know, they tell you things that um, can help you in like tightening up some things. They tell you what they what they see in your work or your voice and what's good. And then what it is, is it's the opportunity to follow up with them. It's right. the opportunity to connect so that they say, hey, yeah, let's, let's connect, let's contact. Um, are you open for assignments? You know, let's work. So those are, you can find those um, you know, they post them online, mm-hmm. but a lot of times these organizations I was talking about, like NABJ and PPA and things like that, they will advertise, um, you know, that a portfolio review is happening. And then you can, some of them are free, um, mm-hmm. like, uh, New York times is right. Um, but what they do with that one is they make a selection. I forgot what the number is out of all the applicants. Right. They select. Like I think they said it was like over 3,000 mm-hmm. time and they selected like 100. Mm-hmm. Um, but then there are some that you pay, you pay, you know, to be able to attend the, attend the review. Right. I want to quickly plug in that the uh, visual task force of NAVJ is actually um, having a video portfolio review coming up soon. I, we kind of closed the, de- the uh, application process, but it was free to NAVJ members. We have people from broadcast, newspaper, documentary work that'll be looking at people's work and giving good feedback. I think uh, portfolio reviews are just about listening to what people have to say. Sometimes people may not say something that you feel is valuable and sometimes they will. So you kind of just have to weigh the good with the bad and just keep an open mind, I think. Um, and don't think they're not personally attacking you. They're trying to help you understand your work better in a sense and help you grow unless they are personally attacking you, but that's another <laughs> story. Another thing. 
Right. Um, so awesome. So I have a, another question in here from Ali T that wants to know what was everyone's first big investment that they made in their freelance career? What did you buy that was the, your biggest investment? Oh man. Uh, for me, it was like underwater housing and Nikonos five camera, a medium format camera and like literally just all my money going to film. Like, I know. <laughs> <laughs> like, what Gabrielle is saying is if you need someone to pay for your um for your portfolio <laughs> review she got it yeah, it's, just, it's just yeah so um yeah I think those are all my birth, first big purchases just because those are things I needed for my project and that's something I wanted to focus on so yeah it was those were and that wasn't all at once I'm not like that but that was over like a span of like five years that I accumulated mm. So were so, you doing that while you were working at the paper? Were yeah, you just buying, oh, at that's the smart. papers, I was like buying stuff. I was like saving up money. I was like, you know, developing things on the side when I could afford it. And it was rough, but we're here. <laughs> you did it, you did it. Anyone else want to answer that one? I'm trying to shoot through these because I think we're going to end at eight. I got studio lights, mm -hmm. camera gear. And like Gabriella said, mine was like over time. So what I would do is as I got paid, you know, from jobs, I would reinvest that into getting equipment that I needed to be able to do, you know, work that I wanted to do that I didn't have, you know. So I would rent at first, rent gear to figure out like, you know, what was going to be best and then mm -hmm. reinvest. Smart. Very smart. I am a big fan of not spending my own money. So um, for those of you that follow tell me us, already. Tell us how. Oh, <laughs> man, nah, I'm not, man. Um, no. <laughs> <laughs> um, after I answer this really quickly, I do want to go back to something Gabriella said about um, licensing. I think she should talk a little bit more about that because I know that some of you guys, some of y'all, excuse me, you guys was incorrect. Some of y'all would um, be able to take some positive things from that. Um, so basically what I'm trying to say is that there are many brands that um, sometimes are evil adjacent and want the ability to just be associated with um, a, a artist of color and so if you wait for the right time or you meet someone you can maybe not have to pay for something or rent it or borrow it or just try it out long enough um so sometimes i mean y'all know me um or you've seen if you have you've seen my work and you'll see that sometimes i'll like try a Hasselblad camera or like i'll um you know just i even shared this thing about some apple stuff today like just at the right time if you can show hey i am someone in your target market and everyone else, or not everyone else, a lot of the people that you um, portray using this are white, there is a chance where you can um, borrow, keep, use some things um, from them just because they need another voice that'll occasionally give them feedback. Now, just like other things, if you're not comfortable with that, just buy it straight up. But for me, sometimes it's actually kind of amazing because you're like, oh, well, I didn't actually have to pay this and it I didn't have to pay for this and I don't have to pay taxes on this. So this is just kind of exists in the space. Mm -hmm. So there's like different trades that you could do or things just, just to keep, put it out there. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I don't want to be more specific than that. I got you. That's awesome. So some license you can win gear. Sorry. Some, comp some competitions yes. you can win gear too. Like the prize is, you know, gear. So there's that. Prize is gear. If there's brands that you follow that are like responsible on social or they seem like they're doing different things, like, um, you can say like, oh, I'm gonna go on this trip. Or I'm gonna try this thing. Um, can I DM you? I'd like to talk about this more. Like it, it, it'll it take a while to get in the habit of it. But like, once you figure out ways to be strategic, it can be a good way like um, without being, yes, that's all I'm gonna say. I'm not trying to lose any of my money. <laughs> I gotcha. I don't want to be like Audrey said. <laughs> <laughs> um. So you were saying something about licensing. I don't know how quickly, uh, Gabriella, you could talk like Gabriella. about that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, any of you all jump in because I am still, like I said, learning about it. But basically what happens is like someone reaches out to you and they're like, hey, we really want to use this picture for, you know, reopening California or whatever. And we want this picture of your friends. So you are able to, de depending on like the circulation, how many people are going to see it. Um, and then the client itself, you get to come up with a rate to charge them. So, and then you own the rights to the image and then they, for like, I guess in the agreement you can put for like this amount of time, like mm -hmm. you can have this image. And then if they want to renew that, they can pay an additional sum of money. Um, yeah, that's, don't, that's get, don't get caught in the in perpetuity trick bag on the licensing. And, you know, sometimes companies will reach out and say, 
we'll give you credit to use this. Don't get caught in the credit trap too. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, they have money. They can license. You say, oh, you want to license the image? Let me send you my rates. Mm-hmm. Yeah, let me don't misunderstand what I just said as lag like, someone for credit. What I'm saying is if you oh, no. proactively need some, no, 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 not you. I'm okay. talking to the, okay. the audience. No, 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 ma'am. I would never disrespect you like that. <laughs> um, what I mean is that if you need something and you are already on the way um, and you can say that you use this thing on your way, like it could be helpful. And for those of you who are like, I have 600 followers, who cares? Trust me. They care. <laughs> they care. Um, because the feedback is more important than the like the posting of the thing. Second, um, so what they're saying to you is every single thing you have has value. So think about even like for the the 90s babies that are used to getting those like AOL discs and the new Windows things, like those landscape photos, those photos were licensed in perpetuity. Every time, like just really fast, this is usage there are a couple different opportunities for usage. So there is OOH, which is out of home. So that's when you like get home and you get like a postcard in the mail from like anthropology. That's like, we're having a sale. Then there's billboard, which is on a billboard. There is um, digital, social, um, and and then you can break those up between paid use and organic use. Paid use is like, um, you know, Gabriella has this uh, denim jacket brand and um, I take some photos and they put like Facebook ad money behind it. That costs more than organic use, which is just her putting it on social. Why? Because essentially the usage gets scaled up in terms of price based on if it will directly bring that brand money, right? So if you get that out of, out of home thing and it tells you there's a sale, you're much more likely to go on there to spend money than you would otherwise. So just if someone asks you if they can license something, ask them what they're going to use it for and for how long. And so it's going to cost more money to use it for six months, three months, six months, one year, two years, forever, right? And also remember that forever is rough. And lastly, that anyone that you use to, in those photos should get paid because models, their faces should also, their likeness should be paid if they're in association with, association with the brand. Awesome. Thank you guys. Okay. I'm going to ask two quick questions that are either yes or no. And um, it's yes or no, or what is your business like? Right. So the first question is, do you have insurance for your equipment? So that's a yes or no. And then the second, okay, everyone's saying yes. (laughs) And well, the second question is, are you an LLC? What is your business type real quick? Corporation. I'm in the process process of setting up an LLC. Okay. And what'd you say, Andre? I have an LLC escort. Talk okay. to a tax professional. I'm so sorry, y'all. I'm going to fight my it's neighbor okay. when I go Keep, outside. We got to go because it's two minutes. Go ahead. Did you say anything else? Just the escort? And people can look that up. Okay. You can use ink file if you need to sign, but also talk to somebody about it beforehand. Yeah. Awesome. All right. Maybe thank you. Advice. Oh. Yeah. On that. Okay. Thank you, guys. Follow all these black women, please. <laughs> Follow them on the internet. I'm not kidding. If oh, you yes, ain't following them. It. If you ask me any questions after this is over and you ain't following them, I'm fighting y'all. Anybody that DMs me, any questions, you're not following all three of these women, I'm not answering your question. Um, man, oh man. Follow them on Instagram, on Twitter, yes, everywhere. We've, we've Some of us has changed our Instagram. I mean, put our Instagram handles as our name on here. So mine's at Alyssa Pointer. Gabriella's is at Gabriella with a dot in the middle. Sharice May is at Sharice May. And Andre is at, at Andre with a U. Um, thank you guys so much. This conversation, I believe, was really great. I learned a lot. I hope you all were able to expand your knowledge on things. We got a lot of great thank yous from folks out here. So shout out to us. And also, um, if you would like to follow the Visual Task Force on uh, Twitter, we are VTF and ABJ. We are a, a group that likes to um, promote Black photographers, graphic designers, anyone, anything that's visual and editorial. We'd really like you all to follow us. We do Mondays where we put out jobs that we find on the internet. Follow us on Instagram, follow us on Twitter. Um, I feel like I'm wrapping it up. Um, <laughs> thank you guys so much for speaking and having this conversation. I hope people learned a lot. Um, but like I said, our Instagram handles have been changed to our names on the um, Zoom call. So I think that's all I have to say. Thank you guys so much. Thank you for having (laughs) me. Thank you. And then we will say goodbye. Bye, everyone. Bye. Reach out if you have questions. Yes. That was efficient. Goodbye.